Yes, sir. Everything is okay. Um, shall we begin the session, sir? Yes, sir. I am set. Very good evening, one and all. Uh, today we are going to have a wonderful session. It is on our 99th webinar session. Uh, with this eminent speaker from Christ University, Professor Satya Silan Sar is here. He is going to share uh, uh, my important thing. Everyone uh, shouting that the happiness principles. Even for me, also looking uh, uh, for that, sir. I would like to learn a lot from you. Now I request, uh, uh, I, in, I invite you on behalf of the Department of Psychology, American College, and core team, the Mental Health Webinar Series. I welcome you, sir. Now I request Mr. Krishnan to introduce the speaker to the participants over here. Sir, over to you. Good evening, friends. Today we are going to have a fantastic session by Dr. Satyashidan from Christ University. Before introducing him, I would like to have a few uh, instructions. Uh, which you can oblige. Uh, please keep your mic on mute mode so that uh, it will give a conductive space for everyone to learn. Also, you know, when you are on video, kindly uh, maintain the online etiquette so that, you know, others feel safe and comfortable. And you can send your questions uh, to uh, our mail ID, mywebinarfeedback at gmail.com. And you can unmute your mic during the question and answer session, and you will be queued and you will be given a chance to ask question. Uh, Professor Satyasilan will be happy to uh, answer your questions. So now it's a, my immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Satyasilan, uh, who is going to present on happiness principles. He is an associate professor and uh, head of the Department of Organization, Behavior, and uh, Human Resources in the School of Business Management at Christ University. And his uh, uh, doctorate topic is, you know, on spirituality, flourishing, and work engagement. This combination will help uh, the work environment and, you know, uh, personal satisfaction at work. Uh, all this thing will be enhanced. His research interests are in employee engagement, workplace engagement, positive psychology, happiness, flourishing leadership, spirituality, and mindfulness. He has got immense experience of 24 years with the global corporations in leadership roles and human resource manner, human resources department, and with the multinational like Nokia and other companies, Alliance and other companies. And he has got uh, immense teaching experience at uh, premium institutes in India, like uh, Christ University, Symbiosis in Pune, and uh, Alliance Business School. He, he, now we are going to have a great session by Dr. Satya Shilan, Christ University. Over to, you, over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Krishnan, sir. And I really need to thank uh, Mr. Krishnan and Dr. Murugeshan for inviting me for the session. I also need to thank my wife, Dr. Anurada, who actually introduced, you know, the, so really thanks to all of them I'm here. And I'm really passionate about this topic uh, because uh, although I'm not a psychologist by training, but I have done my research PhD topic on this particular aspect, where it's always been intriguing to me, you know, what makes us happy because many times I know we have been in organizations and we get, we really get tired and we think when is this going to end, when I'm going to stop earning money. So this has always been on my top of mind. So that's one of the reasons why this topic has been of great interest to me. Uh, I'm not uh, kind of, I don't want to claim that I know everything, but what I'm going to share is some, some uh, review, uh, literature, some research. So it's not going to be the, no philosophical input. It's primarily going to be primary research-based uh, content that I'm going to things that I've learned uh, as part of my PhD. Uh, but certainly what I intend to kind of offer in this session is uh, to understand what we mean by happiness, what, you know, what, what is happiness. I'm, I, I'm sure all of us as, as women, we have an idea of what happiness is. But then how do we become happy? So I'm going to give some pointers uh, of uh, what makes us happy and how we can be happy in life. So with that, I think I will start with a story. I think all stories are interesting to all of us. So I will start with a simple story, you know, uh, this goes something like this, you know, one day there's an enlightened sage in a forest, you know, who's, who's very well known in the country. He is going through a forest where the sina, there's a sannyasi who's you know, doing severe penances to do, get, you know, attain enlightenment. And on seeing the sage, he comes and says, oh sage, when will I attain enlightenment? 
So the sage says, how many stars do you see in the sky? Uh, to which the sannyasi says, oh sage, it's still not, the daylight is still not set, but I can already see some hundreds of stars in the sky. So the sage says, you'll be born a hundred times before, before you attain enlightenment. And then this man on hearing this becomes very miserable. He says, you know, what is the point of all my penance in this life if I can't uh, know, uh, attain enlightenment in this life? So saying that, he probably leaves his penance and walks away. And then the sage continues his journey. He goes you know, uh, to his walking and then there's a woodcutter he meets on the way. And the woodcutter seeing the sage comes rushing and says, oh, the word sage, when will I attain enlightenment? To which the sage asks, "How? what do you see about? The woodcutter says, you know, he's a woodcutter, he's under a tree. So he says, sir, I'm standing under a tree and I see its branches and leaves. So the sage says, how many leaves does the tree have? Uh, the woodcutter, you know, he's a little illiterate. So he says, oh sage, I only know to count a thousand, but there are many more than a thousand leaves as I can see on the tree. And then the sage says, you will be reborn a thousand times before you attain the enlightenment. On hearing this, you know, the woodcutter thanks the sage and jumps with joy. Oh, I just have a thousand birds to live. So kind of, you know, it's a contract. So, you know, a hundred lives, a person who's focused on happiness or so focused on enlightenment, a hundred lives is too much for him. And here is this probably a little bit illiterate, a little bit this one, but who takes takes a thousand birds so happily. So uh, the, the message kind of, you know, what I want to convey to this story is that actually happiness is not a state to arrive. There's no end goal that this is where I will be happy. If I reach this, I'll be happy. Many times we get the kind of thing, you know, what if I, if I, uh, if I save so much of money, I'll be happy. If I have a house, I will be happy. If I get a probably beautiful partner, I'll be happy. So I think it's, it's really not some of those things that we arrive at it, probably it's a manner of living. That's what is a message, you know, probably even through this whole presentation, that's what I will say, although I will be certainly sharing some, you know, uh, not techniques, actually some ways of being happy and some things we can do to be happy. Uh, but the whole idea is that it's not an end goal. There is no goal as happiness. We just need to do things that we are happy with uh, to actually be happy. So that's that's really the message I want to uh, kind of drive through, through the story. So what is that we are going to talk about in the session? Uh, probably defining happiness. I'll explain why we need to define happiness, probably give up. Flavor because for lay and lay people, many of us we really don't what we are. We know what happiness, but still it's important from a certain perspective to define happiness. The different kinds of happiness that different philosophers uh, different philosophers have spoken about. Why happiness is important? I'll share some insights into that and how to increase our happiness levels. So these are the, probably the broad four. Uh, not that I'm restricting to this topic, but probably the takeaway from this session are these four topics. So what is happiness? Maybe I would like to see some chat uh, before we kind of proceed. So if I can see some chat out there, uh, know what, what the audience here thinks happiness is about. Can I quickly see some words out there? Some words, you know, if some of you can put in some words out there. Yeah, pleasant feeling, yeah. Kind of get it, pleasant feeling, attitude, self-satisfaction. Sure, exactly. So something like this, I'm sure as laymen, we all we all kind of have a clue of what happiness is and, you know, uh, this one. Uh, but I'm sure where I, I kind of close the chat, but I know uh, that the words will not be very different. Probably we can often describe it in terms of having joy, pride, contentment, gratitude. And this word cloud kind of describes most of it. Sometimes our children, our kids are a joy. So that's just happiness. You know, uh, help sometimes, you know. Uh, is uh, this one lifestyles, all this becomes happiness. But from a research, but why do we need to actually define happiness? The reason I'm telling you need to have a understanding of happiness, especially from a research perspective or from somebody who's wanting to understand what happiness is that, so that we can know when we say we want to be happy, we actually need to know what we define as happiness. And therefore we know what causes that happiness and what is the effect of that happiness. That's really, so therefore I'm gonna share a definition, uh, like in all social sciences, you know, there is no one definition. But I like the, really the definition given by this author. I'm not able to pronounce it so clearly, but forgive me, Sonia Lyubomirsky. I think that's how it's pronounced. She written a very book, written a book on the how of happiness. And she offers this definition that it's happiness is the experience of joy, contentment, or positive well-being combined with a sense that one life is good, meaningful, and worthwhile. So from this definition, basically, I take away two things. One. It's, it's a set of fleeting positive emotions. For example, this picture depicts it. Somebody likes it, for example, if you want to go to a movie, it makes us temporarily happy. 
but probably two hours later from when we come out of the movie, it still makes us unhappy because we have some other things on our mind. So something that's just uh, you know, gratification of the senses, the senses respond to this kind of feeling. So that's one uh, definition of our understanding of happiness where you get from this particular definition. The second is, you know, deeper sense of meaning and purpose in life. For example, this picture of uh, the, uh, uh, probably a youngster is teaching a set of school kids probably who don't have proper infrastructure. They're sitting on the ground. I'm sure on a day-to-day -day basis, this going to be a nightmare. You know, there are no school, there's no seating, there's no board. Uh, but for this person who's going to teach, in the long run, whatever the circumstances, what are the constraints you or she's facing, they see a sense of purpose. So this is really what, you know, kind of from this definition I take away. And therefore that brings us what are the two types of happiness? I said I said we will talk about the two types of happiness. So therefore, that brings me to the next topic of what the two types of you know happiness. So and uh, there is one you know I want to share the story, uh, not a story and in, you know for example an example. There is this lady called was this this lady called Christina Onassis. I think uh, we will know her. Those of us who are a little bit older, we will know Aristotle Onassis. He is most well known. He's a business tycoon, but most well known for marrying the widow of John F. Kennedy, Jacqueline Onassis. So his daughter, Aristotle's uh, Onassis' daughter, Christina Onassis, no, she inherited well beyond imagination and she splurged on every kind of extravagant pleasure she could think of. Uh, you know, and she, she, in her, as she says in this book, at that some point of time, her only focus on gratifying her senses. That's, that's one way of how people live no, the pursuit of pleasure as a means of life satisfaction. And how do we kind of, it's, it's an immediate sensory gratify, gratification. For example, we want to go for movies, we want to have a lunch or dinner, uh, you know, probably we go, you know, some of us may prefer going to a pub, you know, something, you know, we just, so those are one that, that is immediate gratification of our senses and something, you know, the fundamental moral obligation here is to maximize the experience of pleasure. So in this sense, sometimes you will find how do researchers measure this? They might ask things of you like, do you know what do activities do you do that gives you pleasure? Do you believe in things like life is short, so eat desert first? Do, th do you do, do things that excite you? So this is a way, you know, so one philosophy of, you know, this one, which is called the first of pleasure, hedonism, I think the most well-known prop proponent of uh, the school is, you uh, know, uh, the Greek philosopher called Epicurus, I think he lived somewhere in 4th century BC. Uh, even in India, we have some of those uh, groups or you know, historical, philosophical groups that I think if you are, some of you are familiar with the Indian schools of philosophy, the Charvakas. The Charvakas were known for this materialistic, this, there is nothing beyond the gratification of senses. That's one of the fundamental beliefs. So Epicurus, you know, a, a Greek philosopher gave this, you know, that's hedonism, that's gratifying the senses is one way of attaining happiness. The second is, you no. Know, Pursuit of a meaningful life as a means of satisfaction. Probably the most well-known proponent of this school of thought is Aristotle, who said the fundamental aim of human life is to live a happy life. And he said a happy life comes from living a meaningful life. And here I will throw, I'm, I'm not sure if there are people uh, from overseas or outside of India participating, by, because they, some of them express interest. But there is this lady, you know, uh, I think people in Karnataka might be very familiar with this lady. Salo Maratha Thimmatta, who is now one or eight years old, she dealt with her childless life in a very, very unique way. She planted nearly 400 or 385 trees on a four kilometer stretch of NH 49. Now, if one were to look, she planted those trees 70 years back. Nobody had a clue what she was doing. Nobody cared. No, and appreciating it, but something that you know so adds meaning to life. So that's one perspective of happiness. So this is something bring being true to one's inner self, identifying virtues and cultivating and be all that you can be. And some of the questions, you know, some of the thoughts, you know, the, the you might probably experience when people are asking, doing a research, you know, how do you live your mind in life meaningfully? Be will be around questions like, do you have a higher purpose in life? Do your things that benefit other people and owning responses. These are some of the ways. Uh, so the two types of happiness, uh, you know, is hedonic and eudaimonia. The, the, these are two schools. And this school is, of course, even in India, we have, for example, uh, you know, Aristotle, of course, the most well-known Greek philosopher who, who propagates this. But even in India, if you see.
if you look at philosophy, uh, what the Bhagavad Gita says, no? karma nieva adhikaraste, maapadeshu kadasana, no, do your duty, no, uh, no, have a meaning in life, no, just do what you think you can do. So that's, that's also please, you know, that this particular, this one, I'm not getting into the different schools of philosophy, that's really not the scope, but just to have a flavor that this, this tippy, these two types of schools have found uh, their place in every, every civilization. Uh, now the question is, you know, for example, uh, today I, I think, you know, Suresh, Dr. Suresh made it, you know, kind of, sorry, Dr. Murugeshan made it very clear that he's very keen on understanding, you know, happiness and there's a lot of importance. They're all talking about it and all that. And it is true, there's a lot of focus being on happiness. I'm not sure whether it is the right thing to do, but I just did some Google search. This is as of two o'clock today afternoon. Uh, if you see the, I did a search on happiness, I did a search on unhappiness, and I did a search of sadness. And you can see the results. 78 crores or 780 million posts on happiness, which means people are looking for happiness so much more. And how many people are looking or interested in posting about unhappiness? Probably one crore or 10 million, if you put it in million. Sadness, probably 11 crores, which is, uh, but even if you add up both unhappiness and sadness together, it doesn't match up to what happiness leads to, you know, almost six and a half times, 600 percent more. So it's very obvious, all of us are in search of happiness and not in search of unhappiness or sadness. Obvious that the society we're living in is focusing on that. Now, you know, coming to some more information, for example, in 1776, what the point I'm trying to make, you know, drive is that the modern society is so, so focused on happiness. For example, the 1776 US Declaration says that all men have a right to the pursuit of happiness. Some more information, 1926, the happy birthday song gets in when it makes us happy. Birthday, happy birthday kind of a scenario that gives us happiness. 1960, the smiley face, you know, really very commercial here because this is a company, it's so the smiley face company leases out, you know, all the, the smileys that you see around, those symbols, it goes for $185 million, you know, across the globe. So annual licensing, it's a licensing company among the top 100 licensing companies in the world, and they make so much of money on, out of this business of happiness. 1977, McDonald's introduced the Happy Meal. No, uh, try to uh, a family sitting together and having a good meal. No, he made. Uh, I think this, those of us a little bit older in the 40s and 50s, maybe we will remember that this 1988 Bobby McFerrin song, "Don't Worry, Be Happy," which became such a big hit for all of us. I think many of us are actually listening to it so often because that 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 need to be happy was so high. Uh, now, very recently, for example, 2011, the U.S. and the UN General Assembly has adopted that the, the uh, you know, attainment of uh, happiness is a fundamental human goal. Again, you know, society raising a lot of, and I think in India, probably most of the time, they focus on economic development. Today, India, you know, for example, also looks at happiness, but unfortunately, we are probably not uh, right there, but the focus on happiness is becoming extremely serious business. Modern society is extremely, extremely focused on living a happy life. Now, the question is why? Why are we so hung on happiness? Why are we looking at Happiness is a big. There's some some very strong reasons, and one reason, of course, I will share. You know, the the reasons is happiness is good for health, helps people. You know, like, less likely to you know happy people are less likely to get sick. The second is happiness. Happy people have more fulfilling marriages. They have more friends. Third is happy people make more money. I probably share a research example here. They they are more productive at work. Happy people are more generous. You know, happy people can cope with stress and happy people more creative and get to see the big picture. I mean, nothing, I'm not presenting anything surprising here, something that you didn't show. But what I want to point out is who benefits from this. You know, for example, if you look at today individuals, individuals will want to be happy because they want to have good wealth, you know, good health. They want to have fulfilling marriages. They want to have more friends and they want to cope better with stress. Organizations, how do they benefit from happiness? Because it makes for more productive employees. So, Organizations want people to be employees, more creative, see the big picture. They want leaders to be creative and big picture. And especially in this, this you know, world of COVID-19 and this VUCA world that we're talking of, everybody wants you to be doing different things. So organizations are also hung on happiness. They want the employees to be happy. Society, for example, less likely to get sick. Societies are more because governments and country, countries and governments want people to be happy because they know they have to less, spend less on healthcare if the people are happy. They know that if people are happy, they make more money, actual GDP, actual economy. And they know that happy people are more generous, they are more willing to share. They, you know, they try and bring down the economic disparity that exists. So therefore, whether it be it individual, be it you know, organizations, be it societal, all of us know that being happy is in some way contributing towards 
you know, as a society, as individuals, and therefore this this whole focus on happiness. Okay, and some examples. I, I said I think we made very generic statement that happy people are uh, more this one, but there is this very there some of the study. I just picked up one sample, you know, uh, and this is you know uh, students that picked up and who were identified as happy students. It's a longitudinal study. Sixteen years later, they found out that people who are seen as happy people in the college were earning more money. One more example, for example, this is a more a data collection study. What they did is they looked at people who seemed genuinely happy in their school yearbook or college yearbook. And then they looked at how they, they found out that women who seemed to be genuinely happy, jumping with joy, probably in the yearbook, showing very exciting, you know, facial images, they turned out to be having more happy, more married, you know, have sad, more satisfied marriages, you know, satisfying marriages. So some research data very clearly pointing that this genetic statement that we hear, happiness is good, there is some very strong fundamental research basis for this kind of uh, this one. Good, so we heard you know, why happiness and you know, how is it important. Now the question, the big question, how do I become more happy? What contributes to my happiness? And my, my, uh, this one will be surrounding around uh, you know, three, uh, this one, societal conditions. I, I'm actually tempted to ask a few, few questions here, but I think in the interest of time, I will proceed uh, this one. But, Basically, my, my answer to this question will be surrounding these three areas, societal conditions of happiness, economic conditions of happiness, and personal conditions of happiness, things that can make us happy. This is some data that you, you will find. It's a commonly available data. This is a survey data that is being done. So there is a clear evidence that people who live in certain countries tend to be happy. I'm sure you can see if you're, uh, if you're watching the screen, you will know that countries like US, Canada, Australia, the Scandinavian countries around, you know, even uh, you know, some of these countries, you know, uh, they, they all seem, the ones that are pointed in green arrows, they all seem to be much more happy because at some level, societal conditions, you know, probably the, the need to struggle less for life or basic necessities makes a certain people happy. Uh, not very, you know, kind of flattering, but I think India is somewhere we can do better. I'm sure we can do better with our history and with our way of doing this. We can certainly be better, but probably what's holding us back is a little bit of economic development. So, uh, but the message from this one, uh, you know, do, are there certain say, specific locations or specific societies where you live if you uh, will be happy? Certainly, yes. Yes, if you, you know, for example, for youngsters who are looking to immigrate, probably Canada, US, and Australia, and Scandinavian countries may be a good idea. That's this one. But more importantly, you know, uh, how can we make India happy? How can we make our societies happy? I think one certain way is economic development. So therefore, all of us, if we are more productive, if we are doing better things with the improve our economy, I mean, we don't need to be doing great things. We can just do our job better and earn more. Uh, that's all I'm telling. I'm not telling we need to kind of uh, just, we, we take care of ourselves and our families, I'm sure, as a society, we're going to be a little bit more happy. So that's better. Of course, there is some some you know, reasons also that why people can be unhappy, you know, internal conflicts or conflict with neighboring regions. So exactly the reason why we should be avoiding any conflict with the neighboring countries, because where countries have conflicts with each other around the neighbors, there seems to be a sense of unhappiness. So how can we make a country happy? Probably try and avoid conflicts as much as possible, try and you know, make you know, economic development as a focus. As individuals, we contribute in the best way we can in terms of you know, improving society. Now that brings us brings me to the next question of money and happiness. I think here I would like to kind of ask a question. I'm tempted to stop and ask a question and ask, do you think, what's your opinion? Do you think money contributes to happiness? And uh, what's your thought? Quick, yes, no, maybe, you know, what, what do you think? You know, this one, okay. People are telling no, yes, no. To an extent, yes, okay. <laughs> Maybe, no, yeah, I think, yeah, the opinion is divided. I can understand. I'm sure many of us believe that our money is not the, you know, the temporary happiness, certainly not always. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really uh, so, so grateful for your interactions. Uh, you know, wonderful to see all the you know, wonderful uh, you know, reactions. It really enthuses me, makes me know that you're all involved in what I'm sharing. Uh, but I'm going to share some data. So really, again, coming from research, it's not an opinion. I'm not going to state whether money is going to make you happy. I'm going to present you some data uh, which can make us take a call what exactly it is. Okay. So some, some, you know, this is this one. Wealthy nations tend to be happy. So it looks like there is evidence that money suddenly seems to be making people happy because economically developed countries seem to be a little happier. 
but then there's also data us you know gdp has doubled you know us economy has doubled but the happiness levels of not reason so there's a conflicting opinion money makes happy developed economies or economies are happy but us economy has developed but people are not happy any more happy than they were used korean you know for example uh, korean some of the most wealthy people you know are committing suicide i'm sure all of you heard of k pop many of the k pop groups you know are actually the stars are committing suicide uh, you know they have everything they want they have fame they have money but god knows why but something is going wrong so so again conflicting message that money may not be the only key to uh, make us happy some millionaires are dissatisfied because they are not billionaires and we also know i'm sure in india we we, we tend to see this because of a spiritual orientation uh, a religious orientation our sense of you know the nishkama karma attitude makes us think you know we have, we see so many people who are very ordinary may not be earning a huge income probably they're staying in a very small house you uh, know uh, they but still they seem to be very happy with uh, what they're doing so there is this conflicting message coming you know does money really make us happy we really don't know but i'm going to share some data which comes from very strong research uh, that says you know study finds that there is a correlation between money and happiness uh, this is a us based study so there are two us based study one study says till 75000 there is a direct correlation between money and happiness so which means if you earn 75000 per year the money key the happiness keeps going up but beyond that the happiness tapers off beyond that let's say you earn 1 lakh dollars you are not going to be any more happy you are just going to be as happy probably as you were at 75000 dollars another study by purdue university says the same thing but this time the money is 125 uh, no thousand dollars which means you know your happiness keeps on increasing till 125000 dollars but beyond that it doesn't go up so there's some research basis the graph so shows probably you can replace i showed the graph with 75000 dollars just replace with 125000 dollars and we have the answer that probably beyond that so there are these two studies that provide some some basis to say uh, that you know income does uh, suddenly uh, kind of this and even for example i know a story in brahadaranya upanishad uh, one of the question no yajna valkya and you know um uh, maitre are having a discussion and she asked will wealth make me happy so yajna valkya the sage says you know what wealth will make you only as comfortable as it can but it not it cannot make you happy or it cannot enjoy you and get enlightenment uh, so some of those you know so there is there is some basis to say that money suddenly makes us happy because it increases our comfort level that physical comfort our daily struggles of life are reduced so we don't have to worry you know worry where our next meal is coming from so suddenly there is some basis to say money can make us happy but there is a limit to which it can take us so basically uh, and i'm just giving some this is my calculation please this is not some research i have just converted the 75000 dollars and i have taken this 125 dollars it's not direct conversion i have taken a, a, a measure called the purchase power parity this is not economic class i'm just please you can do google what purchase power parity is but it works out to 18.38 dollars so basically it says if you were looking from indian perspective maybe anywhere between 14 lakhs to 23 lakhs is probably where we are most you know our happiness peaks beyond that uh, it uh, this is just you know conjectures i'm making based on the data that's been on the year so maybe let's say you might think uh, not 23 maybe it's 30 lakhs and somebody say may not 14 lakhs maybe 12 lakhs is sufficient for me but some indication telling that money certainly seems to be having also uh, i really want to in some way settle the question if there's a mind you know what Uh, money does not make me happy no there is some basis to say that money is certainly has some some basis for you uh, know uh, this one now uh, the other factor so we covered uh, societal factors we covered economic factors now we come to individual factors now again i want to ask you a question which of these factors do you think contributes to individual happiness does a biological constitution or genetic constitution does it contribute to happiness does our individual circumstances contribute to happiness maybe i'll go with the first one genetic factors do you think the genetic factors contribute to happiness i just want a simple yes or no if you can give me a simple yes or no okay uh, i see some yes um anybody else yes no some people are telling no uh, mostly yes some no yes okay some extend yes okay so yes i know i think we will go there so individual circumstances by that i mean material conditions and the third is uh, no behavior i think the samajya is saujanya is telling all three factors are important yes we will see some evidence of that again from research it's not my invention it's from research for example research shows some research very clear many researchers are now pointing out that there is a very clear indication that biological factors 
have a reasonably or equally important role to play. It says that it contributes, the studies say that it contributes to up to 50%. I know some of us will start questioning, you know, you know what, if biology is going to contribute my happiness, whatever I'm going to do is not many. That's not really the case. For example, if I tell that today I have a magic wand and I, I say by magic wand, I make all of us genetic clones of each other. Just by I'm telling, we all have make, become genetic clones of each other. So does it mean all our happiness levels are the same? No. There is going to be, our happiness levels are going to be different, but the differences may be a little bit lower. It doesn't mean that just because we are all biological, biological similar, all of us are equally happy simply because the behavior and circumstances do contribute. But 50% or so fairly substantial amount coming from a biological way of thinking that yes, you know, our genetic you know, constitution does contribute to happiness. The second is life circumstances, you know, whether we are rich or poor, married, divorced. Uh, I just want to be a little bit funny and uh, you know, just say, let's say some of you are unhappy with your partners and you're thinking, you know what, I'm living with a lousy partner. I want to change my partner and that's going to make me happy. Please, I want to caution you that's going to only add 10% to your happiness. It's not going to make you extremely happy. So I'm just you know, trying to make be a little bit funny here, but the point I'm trying to make is life circumstances, whether you live in a bigger house or a smaller house, you know, whether you have 10 million income or less than 10 million income, any of those changes is really not going to significantly alter your happiness. But one very important thing that I really want to focus on is that, that's why I said, how can we be more happy? The focus is going to be 40% is contributed by our behavior. How do we behave? So therefore we can very, very voluntarily you know, take on activities that can make us happy. So which means 40%, just in terms of numbers, let's say for example, if you measure a 10 point scale, 5% comes from happiness, one point from circumstances, four point from behavioral pattern. So assume that biologically we are set at five. Even if you're set at five, which is a maximum from a biological point of view, let's say you change your spouse, your partner, your car, your house and all that, it's just going to make they move you from five to six. But what can move you from five to nine, for example, 80% increase on a five, you move to four points, 80% can come from changing your behavior. How do I behave? So well, that's going to really make a difference in terms of whether we can be happy or not. So that's something. So therefore, you know, I just want to kind of uh, use this you know, serenity prayer that we all, I'm sure all of us know that the serenity, so those of you who disagree that genetic factors may not have, please accept that there is research evidence now sufficiently available that say that genetic factors, for example, it's like, I'm sure you would have noticed, some people eat food, never put on weight, but some people just, they have one burger and the next day, two weeks, you know, two kgs up. So uh, there seems to be some biology happening. The similar, even from a happiness perspective, there is some evidence that there is biology is going to. So let's accept it, uh, you know, kind of, but what can we do? The courage to change, the courage to change comes from trying to change our behavior and the wisdom to know that material circumstances will not substantially alter. Yes, we need to have a comfortable life. We need to earn sufficient money, but really going beyond a certain point is not going to make us any more happier than we are. That's really, uh, you know, from this quote, I wanted to kind of this one. So uh, this probably one quick exercise for us to kind of proceed further. This is a very, very short survey, you know, uh, well-researched, uh, validated and reliable, but very quick, so not, uh, in that sense, may not be so reliable, but maybe you can quickly do and do some mathematics around this. Quickly rate yourself where you are uh, in general for you to know. I don't want you to post it anything here, but do this check for yourself and check how happy you are. You know, in general, I consider myself happy on a scale of one to seven, how happy you are. You know, uh, uh, I'll give a couple of, uh, you know, um, probably 30 seconds for you to then hope you answered the first one. Moving to the second, compared with most of my peers, I consider myself less happy or more happy. What do you know? Don't think too much. Just quickly, you know, uh, get a number. I'm sure many of your psychologists are organized, organized by the Department of Psychology. I'm, I'm sure there are many psychologists around here, but just want to kind of quickly put that number there and say, you know, how do you compare yourself with peers? The third one, you know, some people are generally happy, you know, a question, to what extent does this character, characterization describe you? And the fourth one, you know, some people are generally unhappy, you know, how much does it describe? And probably you can do a quick calculation of this. Uh, just one sec. I think this so quick calculation, add up one, two, three, four, divide by four. Uh, and some scores, this is extrapolated from the country average scores. Uh, maybe this is not a statistical, this one I will not get in, but just, you know, have this understanding that if your average of the scores is 3.47, then probably from a country, India perspective, you are less happy than most people. But if your scores are about 3.79, 
probably you know more happier than most people in the so it's based the indian average is on a 7 point scale is 3.47 3.78 compared to the 10 point scale that we saw earlier in other graphs which says from 4.96 to 5.42 so this is what you know kind of um, this one so i'll move on i hope you all of you can i say all of you have taken this yes no can i see the charts and say can i move on yes okay so i will move on uh i will move on you know kind of this one how can now coming to how can i increase my happiness levels how you know uh, this one so uh, i will probably stress over you know uh, spend a couple of minutes you know telling this there are two ways one is how we can reduce unhappy behaviors and the other is happy behaviors so one is to teach reduce unhappy behavior behaviors other is to have happy behaviors how do we reduce and i will give from research from you know evidence from research quickly rushing through i'm just giving an example let's say we all give a test and we all take a test and you know uh, uh, and there are case one i score very low marks score uh, case two i score very high marks let's look at some examples here so there's a scale of unhappiness to happiness so i'm taking case one i score very low and i'm unhappy because i scored very low case two i'm happy because i scored very high now let's look at another i get the information that my peers are scored lower than me in case 1 i scored low but my peers are scored lower than me so what happens i tend to be a little bit happy oh you know what i did bad but my peers have done uh, more worse than me so that actually actually moves me to a happiness scale so the range may vary some may become extremely happy some may just be the unhappiness may be marginally reduced but there's going to be a movement happening there the second is for example let's say the second case i scored high but i found out that my peers scored much higher than me suddenly I, well, my happiness becomes a little unhappy because all of them have done better than me now there is evidence that shows that people who see this huge jump that i jump from unhappiness to happy because others have not done well and i become unhappy because others have done better than me people who show this huge you no know, kind of uh, you know we are generally those unhappy people who tend to show this kind of happy people who are more contented who don't really compare themselves with too much with others generally tend to be minor more or less no so there is this evidence showing that you know coming back to the slide that social comparison is one huge reason why people become happy so happy individuals are less sensitive to social comparison uh, whereas unhappy individuals you know i think we all know the statement key statement keeping up with the joneses uh, probably unhappy individuals are more focused on not only keeping up but keeping a step ahead of the joneses so social comparison probably is one major reason for unhappiness you know that's something we can try and control try and manage that aspect so that's one evidence the second is imagine the situation again one more example imagine the situation you go to a restaurant and i'm required to make a choice so i walk into a restaurant i'm required to choose whether i'm going to have strawberry or chocolate there is no guarantee i will receive the one i choose so even if i choose strawberry i there's no guarantee i will get chocolate so that's this one now how do happy and unhappy people behave the happy people they really don't care whatever they get so either way they are happy whether they get strawberry they are happy they get chocolate they chose strawberry but they get chocolate they're still happy but unhappy people somehow tend to justify the choice you know what my choice was bad but your choice is worse you know kind of this one you know i'm just this is my own statement i think it's more almost like telling my grapes are sour but the grapes i didn't get are more sour so i opted for strawberry uh, i got strawberry and you know i'm unhappy because it's not really a great taste but chocolate is more horrible so something like that you know all the time looking at from that perspective unhappy people apparently tend to display this kind of behavior so decision rationalization is always this one uh, so i'm going to jump and quickly conclude because four parameters here so social you know comparison is one major reason for unhappy this one so unhappy people tend to do more social comparison unhappy people to rationalize this is in a negative fashion that the what they have is not good but what others have is actually worse so that's something uh, rationalization they do even control apparently you know uh, unhappy people tend to view most interactions in an you know negative way there are research evidence i'm not able to share because of shortage of time but there is an enough evidence to say say that you know unhappy people tend to remember every event in a negative fashion and then self reflection i think many times we feel happy people you know they don't reflect so much so they are they quite happy with what happens happy go lucky but on on the other hand people who think deeply about issues may be unhappy that's really not true research evidence very clearly show so shows 
that unhappy people tend to ruminate more on negative experiences, whereas happy people tend to, tend to dwell a lot more on happy. So that's really the difference, you know. So some some insights that you know I'm not sure how much of this each of you or each each of us can control, but social comparison probably we should try and consciously avoid. Vision rationalization, maybe you can look at the positive side. Even consider maybe the idea is focus more on positive experiences and self-reflection by and uh, kind of this one. Okay, so that's, so let's come back to how to be happy. I think I'm just looking at the time, we have 1950, so we still have 15 minutes to go. So how to be happy, let's come back to that question. So there is no, uh, there is no magic wand to happiness. We can't wave a, ha wave, wave a wand and become happy. But some insight, you know, I'm going to share some you know, ideas on how to be happy. Different, this is Aristotle, you know, uh, statement, different men seek after happiness. So therefore, there is no one way we all can be happy. Not all of us is going to be happy by just, uh, for, for example, let's say you think having a meaningful life is more going and working, working in NGO. Certainly not for all of us. Some of us actually not like to work in an NGO, not go to an orphanage every day, not go to old age home every day. So those, those may not be the activities for all of us. So different means for different people. That's a message I'm trying to kind of uh, convey uh, through this message. And therefore, what makes us happy? Uh, this is really the core. We may not be able to spend too much time, but I still want to give a broad so what makes us happy? There is this very fantastic book written by uh, Martin Seligman, who is a great researcher on happiness. He's written a book on flourish, a visionary new understanding of happiness. He has, you know, very, with, from research, and now there is inner, increasingly enough evidence to say there are these five parameters that make us happy. One is experiencing positive emotions that display behavior that, you know, that enhances our positive emotions. Engagement, you know, doing, involved in whatever we're doing, whatever we do, let's say, even if, for example, it's dishwashing, which none of us may enjoy, or the ladies may say, I don't like to cook. The men may say, you know, uh, you're asking me to go for a, on a, doing a outside tour, I don't like it, but probably engaging, you know, thinking, oh, what am I learning from this? What I can do better? Is there something, you know, how do I, can, so something, engagement, you know, seems to be another. Relationship, you know, very, very, for, even, for example, there's been the strong recommendation during the lock, lockdown, no physical engagement, Social, please, you know, be active, you know, active on your social, you know, this one and build a deal. So relationships bring a lot of more, you know, authentic happiness and connections, meaning, you know, do something that's add meaning to your life and achievement focus on trying, you know, so this was some, you know, some ideas. So PERMA is positive emotions, engagement, relationships, you know, meaning in life and focus on achievement. Some explanation here of what it means to, you know, a sense of gratitude, satisfaction, inspiration, is positive emotion. Engagement is truly trying to engage ourselves in a task, you know, a state of flow. I think the psychologists will understand what I mean by flow. A positive relationship that how can we enjoy relationship with people, whether it's workplace, whether it's family, whether it's society, uh, you know, meaning is you know, try and serve a bigger cause. Not all of us need to be going to orphanages, probably, probably like, you know, Timakas uh, did, maybe we can plant trees, maybe we can, you know, do some sort of, you know, uh, sustainability initiative, something that's, that each of us will have our own way of adding meaning to our lives. So that's something. And accomplishment achievement, you know, focusing on what makes us, you know, uh, what makes us the, feel that we have achieved something in life. Uh, so that kind of brings us, you know, uh, this one, what activities. We may not be able to spend too much of time, but these are list of activities. For example, making new friends and centering connections apparently adds to happiness. Showing gratitude. For example, at Christ University, we always have this gratitude day uh, where probably students are asked to kind of buy some chocolates and share it to the housekeeping staff. And really, you should see the happiness. Both the parties, the students are so happy that they did something. The housekeeping staff are happy because they feel recognized on that day because all other days, we are just ignoring that. But some, you know, some ways of doing that. So maybe we, we can make it more frequent, frequent events. Cultivating optimism, you know, uh, some ways to kind of, for example, focus on the positive. We said unhappy people tend to focus on negatives. Maybe focusing on positive experiences, doing things that makes us optimistic, maybe planning, planning, a, having a plan A, having a plan B. So cultivating optimism by having plan B for any unforeseen situations. Things like, I know I'm just jumping, you know, coping strategies, for example, I'm sure I know uh, my wife, Dr. Anurada, was speaking on you know, uh, whole, you know, holistic happiness, mindfulness, coping strategies, how can you focus on health and all that, so, so many other things, you know, cultivating a growth mind that I'm sure uh, you're all here because you want to grow. So that's also one, I'm sure this is going to, at some sense, it's going to make you feel that I'm growing, I'm participating, I'm learning from so many. Uh, so therefore, cultivating a growth mindset, committing to your goals. Now, I can share my personal example. I remember I was doing my PhD and there was really, I was hesitant to touch my thesis because every time I touched my thesis, I would have butterflies in my stomach. But I remember, you know, everyone around me, you know, 
my wife and my bride and everyone telling you know spend just 10 minutes focus on your goals you will and when i actually started doing it made a, made a huge difference you know what became what started of 10 minutes i actually started spending an hour became two hours and then i really got so committed doing that things really moved forward so sometimes you know we might be hesitant to do that but committing to your goals can actually uh, make us more happy you know kind of meditation and uh, I'm sure in the Indian context, I really don't need to stress on it. I'm sure enough of, enough of more people have talked about meditation, you know, taking care of a body and so religion, we have enough and more in Bruno, we call the Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. We have all those, you know, uh, philosophies that can make us happy. So, you know, there's so many of these activities that can make us happy. So, for paucity of time, I'm really kind of quick, quickly moving forward. Uh, this is some research resources, probably uh, if I share the slides, uh, you, this can be circulated, but some of this comes from this research that how, how can you be more happy, what can you do to be more happy. So, you know, uh, therefore, you know, uh, but, but the point, is, point, point here is don't do those things because you want to be happy. Do those things because you like doing it. Let's say what I'm reading a book, don't read the book thinking you will be happy. Read the book because you want to read the book. That will contribute to happiness because there is a very clear evidence that seeking happiness is one of the major causes for unhappiness. Never seek happiness. Seek to do things that you like. Seek to do things that you love. Seek to do the things that you enjoy. Then happiness is a byproduct. It comes because you do things that you like. That's really the message I want to kind of try. Uh, this kind of, you know, uh, again, summarizing what I said, no secret to happiness. Each of us has to find our own way of happiness. Not everybody can be happy in orphanage. Not everybody can be happy planting trees. Not everybody happy can be happy doing Swachh Bharat. So really, you know, we really have to find our own ways of uh, this one. Fit with the strengths. I think I've given the link here. You can actually, actually find what your strengths are and decide based on the strengths how you can improve your happiness. Fit with the lifestyle. For example, if you're a morning person, there's no point in doing things at late night. Or if you're a late person, there's no point in going to a gym early morning because then it's going to be unhappy. You do it for one week, you do it for three weeks. Probably after fourth week, you're going to be exhausted. You're not going to live that lifestyle. So don't adopt things that is not consistent with your lifestyle. If you're a late person, take up activities that aligns with your late life, lifestyle. If you're an early person, do, a, do things that align with the early life. So for example, going for a walk, early morning walk, when nobody's around the street, maybe going to the gym at that time. So really, it's very individual. It's a person activity fit. So that's something I kind of want to drive uh, this one. So just to summarize the discussions, you know, definition of happiness and its two types, we kind of discuss. We discuss the importance of happiness in modern society, individual organization, this one. We looked at individual, societal, and economic factors that contribute to happiness. We also did a self-assessment of happiness levels, uh, approach to increasing happiness, reduce unhappy behaviors, and uh, how to add happy behaviors. And we discussed a PERMA model, uh, PRMA stands for positive emotions, engagement, relationship, meaning, and uh, achievement as a model for us to kind of see. Uh, I mean, this is not, uh, you know, it, it doesn't solve everything, but it gives us a guidance, guidance that doing these things can be kind of a little bit, uh, you know, make us happy. So I, I started the story. So therefore, I'll also conclude the story. Uh, and this goes like this. For example, I'm sure some of you would have heard it. A professor walks into a philosophy class and he says, you know, uh, the, uh, places a, you know, a bottle of you know, large mayonnaise jar and says, proceed to fill it with golf balls. And he asks the students, is the jar full? They all look at the golf balls full of, the bottle is full of golf balls. They say, yes. Then the professor picks up pebbles. He throws those pebbles in and the pebbles fit in the space. And he now asks the students, uh, is the jar full? And they all say, yes, the jar is full because the pebbles are there. Then he takes the sand. And he says, you know, he puts the sand in it again, and it goes into spaces, it fills it up. So therefore, you know, students are happy, you know, he asks the student, is it full? He says, yeah, they say, yes, it's full. Then the professor, professor produces this two pint of beer into the, this one, and then he pours this, and the water sinks in, and the students laugh, and, you know, kind of, so therefore, this is, so he does it. And then he says, you know, after the laughter is gone, he said, I want you to recognize that the jar is the light, and the golf balls are the most important things. Your family, children, health, friends, you know, this is what the PERMA model says. Your family, your relationships, you know, your work, you know, those are things, you know, Kind of this one, you know, work that adds meaning, not work and this, as the sake of work, but work that adds meaning. So that's something. And the pebbles are the smaller things, your job, your house, and we said the one, the, the one point or the 10% of changing your house, you're changing your car, doesn't, you know, but those are smaller things, doesn't really add happiness. And the sand is all the small stuff. But the problem is if you fill our life with the sand, all the small, small stuff, there is no space for the bigger 
uh, big aspect. So that really is a message. And we, one of the st students asked, okay, what do you mean by, you know, what, what are the beer stands for? And he says, you know, what, no matter how busy you are, you're never busy to have a beer, a couple of beer. I'm not suggesting you should have a beer. Maybe you should have a coffee with your friend. But, but basically telling that you can be kind of, you know, do, you know, the, that's, that's really the message. Uh, so I, I hope I've ended on time. It's 19.25. I'm sorry. I think we took a little bit of five minutes extra, but kind of thank you for listening to me. And if there are any questions, we can kind of take it. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for such an enlightening presentation. Uh, apart from, from being a core member, uh, I'm also an alumni of Christ. So it's oh, so nice. wonderful. Yeah. You I mean, made my day. Oh, it's so wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I've been a, a, a student of Anuradha, ma'am, sir. <laughs> okay, okay. Very. So, so, so happy. Nice. We are always see, happy to see Christ is doing well. So happy to see you there. It's so Thank good to see you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. We yeah. will be now taking questions. Yes. Uh, the first question will be from Brinta uh, Dharmalinam. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Ms. Brenta, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, we'll okay, we'll take the okay. Oh, please raise your hands. The hands have been removed. Um, I request the participants to raise your hands. Whoever has a question, uh, we'll take a question from Brin, Lynn Panakal. Please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir. It was a wonderful session. So, am I audible? Are you able to hear yeah, me? Yes, ma'am. Thank yes. you so much for your feedback. I, yeah, uh, yes, it, sir. Made, it makes my day. Honestly, it makes my day. If I made a difference to all it, of you. It, it was a wonderful day. session and I am quite amazed at how you were able to bring in all aspects and so much of research in this little period of time. It shows your deep commitment to the uh, topic of happiness, your pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, I had a question. You mentioned two schools of uh, thought in Indian philosophy. Uh, right. Could you repeat that, please? I missed that bit. I could, uh, I... Is, yeah, I, I didn't. I, okay, I was not actually referring to schools of Indian philosophy. I said there are two schools of two types of happiness, the uh, hedonic, and the eudaimonia. Udam so, yes, and and uh, you mentioned the Indian. Yeah, Indian. I think uh, some of the schools there. Are the, of course, the Indian philosophy is so rich. I think that's a entire whole series of webinars by itself. Uh, but one of the schools that is Charvaka's. Uh, you know, I mentioned as being you know a materialistic in there. This one. There, some of their beliefs were around. Uh, I think Charvaka. A couple of other. I can't right now recall, but there are a couple of schools that believe that you know all this idea about meaning in life, all these things about you know, uh, you know uh, the search for meaning, doing bigger things has no meaning. You know, nothing has any meaning in this life. A nihilistic kind of an approach. So, Sarva Charvaka is very focused on apparently materialistic, sensual gratification, and no focus. Eat, enjoy, live life. So that's really one. But Indian schools. Are not only two schools, Indian schools are actually more than 12 schools. The, the, I think the Astika and the Nastika schools, that's the Indian classification. Um, honestly, ma'am, that's a huge topic by itself, but this is what I, I in short, I, I, I have to tell you that the, I refer to the Charvaka school, which, which is the Nastika school, doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in anything in life, just probably materialistic orientation. That's one school, yeah. Thank you, sir. Oh, okay, thank you, ma'am. I think if I answered that question, thank you so much. Yes, sir, but it, it was a wonderful session. Thank you. God thank bless you. you, sir, in your pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question will be from Shilpa. Shilpa, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, sir. It was a very wonderful session. Thank you. Uh, sir, I had one doubt. Okay. So when you were uh, talking about uh, how, uh, uh, how unhappy people react, you mentioned like they dwell more on negative experiences in life. Right. So how do we motivate them to start thinking on positive <laughs> and to uh, move <laughs> on with the negative experiences? I know. I mean, if we had that modern magic wand, uh, no kind of we could do that. But I there is really no direct or straight answer I can give, ma'am. But I, if you see, I shared that idea that you know there is one happy, unhappy. This one that's a genetic con constitution that makes us unhappy, and there is a behavior part. I think that is left. I I don't know if we can motivate people to be unhappy 
probably that motivation to be happy you know uh, sorry motivate people to be happy probably that that's that's where the behavior part comes in you know uh, i don't know maybe we can only motivate them to do certain activities that we feel that align with their strengths i we didn't get into that strengths and all that there's a very deep research in terms of how to identify your strengths and take up activities that makes so they even if people are unhappy probably we can help them to under, identify what their strengths are let them start focusing on the strengths and maybe we can guide i'm sure the psychologists like you and you know i have a psychologist at home my wife is a psychologist so all of you can probably guide telling that you know this is a this are your strengths not not focus on the weakness these are your strengths and therefore in alignment with your strengths reduce your social comparison maybe you should take up the you know probably going to the gym is not your task maybe reading a book is for you maybe you know jumping around in sports field is not your task maybe you know kind of meditating is for you so probably there is some way i think there is not enough research done and uh, there's a lot of research on happiness how to be happy but there's not uh, you know i think it's it falls on the clinical psychology side how to make unhappy people happy probably the clinical psychologist are more of an expert on that but my own take on from this research is that probably we should help them to focus on what the strengths are and helping them to take up activities that will make them you know contribute to Uh, not that that happiness the, the activity should be done with a focus on happiness rather they should do those activities which gives them a sense of satisfaction therefore it it contributes as a by product happiness comes and so that's that's really my response i'm not sure if i answered you completely but this really my limited understanding of what you asked and what i respond thank you sir that really makes sense thank yeah, you thank you, you so much thank, yeah. you. thank you thank you sir thank you ma'am yeah. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Advind. Uh, he has mentioned it in the chat box. Sir, I'll read it out to you. Fulfillment of small, small desires and achievements may make us happy. Happiness is within us, just to explore it, isn't it? Absolutely, I agree with it. I think at some level, if we say happiness comes from within, I think the the uh, the the school that says. satisfaction comes from doing meaningfulness is actually what dr arvind is actually referring to but i i don't think we should discount even the small pleasures in life for example i know uh, i have the session but after the session what i would love most is have a cup of coffee but that's not unimportant that's equally important so therefore the sensual pleasures we should not ignore that let's accept we have those senses god or nature as gifted or given us or say sometimes sometimes we we see it as a gift sometimes we see it as a painful thing but let's accept that we are gifted with that we are we are having it so therefore let's not deny that because even in the bhagavad gita you know the, the philosophy is very clear don't torture yourself don't deny things because ultimately your senses are so strong it will come back and hit you you might think i will control myself wake up every morning at 4 o'clock go to the gym but at some point of time your 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 senses will overtake you and your mind will not be able to capture your senses so unless we have reached at extreme level of Uh, you know kind of i remember you know i think i may take a little bit of couple of minutes but i really want to share a story and experience this was i think uh, you know uh, swami yogananda who wrote the book on autobiography of yogi he went to meet gandhi ji once in his varda ashram and he was served i mean yogi you know yoga swami yogananda yogi who was who, who he believed or others believed and attained certain things in life which is not for commoners and gandhi ji was there you know a common man working involved in the world they were having a meal and uh you no know, leaves you know something like palak leaves were served and both of gandhi ji and swami yogananda were sitting and eating and uh, swami yogananda ate that leaf he immediately spat it out it was so bitter he spat it out and next he turned to gandhi ji and he saw gandhi ji was chewing this leaves as he was eating sweets he was enjoying it with so much of pleasure that he was eating so this kind of you know uh, uh, really you know sometimes you know even though we think we can control our senses it is despite our best intentions our senses are not in control so let's not deny that let's accept it simple thing i'm not telling we need to get to the extent of drug addiction no that's really this one but simple stuff a cup of coffee going you know uh, out for a friends you know for a movie this are things we should accept and be normal and then of course the meaningful lives teaching in a ngo going for tree plantation all those things are there but those alone are not i think we are humans we are born with the senses as well as the thinking capability probably one of the gifted you know animals on the planet who have the ability to think for them so we need to balance both so that's really my humble submission let's not deny either both are equally important that's my submission really thank you sir uh, we'll take the next question from akshaya lakshmi thank you for the opportunity ikka uh, thank you 
so much sir it was a really wonderful session thank you, i thank guess you a lot much. of people are going to say that it is a wonderful session but i do say that it is from my heart i say that it is a wonderful session thank you thank you ma'am and uh, thank you sir and uh, during this pandemic i feel like uh, the happiness part is people are forcing themselves to be happy and searching mm -hmm. for uh, how to become happy and some people do say that simple things observe the simple things you will be happy all those things uh, but my personal view is like uh, uh, if we accept the situation that then, then we get the light to see the happiness what do you say about that sir just okay ma'am akshya ma'am i my <laughs> okay <coughs> I kind of I mention. Let's say I I go for a jogging every day tomorrow onwards because I want to be happy. But if I, if I take up jogging because I want to be happy, it is not going to work. Okay. Uh, but if I do thing, if I do go for jogging because I like waking up in the morning and I like to jog when nobody is around, that as a byproduct will bring me happiness. So again, I I really want to go back to that this one that story of hundred years and thousand years. a person penance doing penance for years and years because the focus on enlightenment but this wood cutter is really not you no know, focus on enlightenment he just wants to live happy he is doing his wood cutting he is coming he is ignorant probably doesn't know but even despite telling thousand years is going so the idea is not to chase if you if you chase happiness i can promise you are going to be unhappy we need to chase things that we like to do like i said you know after this you want to go for a cup of coffee great but some of you if i oh my god what a heavy session i really want to want to go for a walk it gives you happiness please go and do it because that you should not do it because that walking is going to make you happy you should do it because you are walking that walking is going to make you feel good and therefore by happiness comes as a by by product that's really you know my dear so don't let's not do things to be happy let's do things because we like doing we enjoy it that's really the core of Uh, this whole you uh, know crux of this entire issue but i think a few people are like covered up with anxiety and fear which they don't feel like uh, that liking part itself is not focused is uh, what i feel uh, because probably therefore i know i my again i know my limited understanding of the depth of clinical psychology you know uh, yeah i think when we talk of happiness there are two kinds of people people who are flourishing and people who are languishing languishing people are people who probably are seeing things in a negative way if there are a clinical issue probably this is not the session probably uh, the clinical people should be the ones addressing it but uh, if we are we are we are those normal people we believe we are normal then probably i would suggest that they probably should identify what the strengths are what they need to focus because many times we are not aware what makes us happy come to the surprise you know for example sometimes you know you don't know reading is your thing you suddenly get hold of a book and you start reading you find oh my god i really love this and that happened to us for example i need to tell this when in our personal life that happened to us when we watching this movies on netflix for many years we actually avoided this prime video and netflix because we thought we will never this this online movie video watching is not but today honestly we spend more time there because we get so much of knowledge information there so many times we don't know what uh, this one so we are all Uh, we think we know everything but actually we don't know much of it i'm sure uh, even einstein told i think even einstein never used more than 90% of his brain so we are honestly very 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 humble very very simple people i think our brain usage is very very limited so yes. so meeting at this meeting Very simple, true, sir. Very true. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Sir, we'll be taking one last question. Would that be okay? Okay, sure. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, it's from Samyukta. Having girls have given about three A's of happiness: acceptance, affection, and achievement. What is your view on it, sir? Ah, uh, okay. I think uh, you know that that answer. I think very good. I think that answer lies already in the perma model I that you shared. I think acceptance comes from that positive emotions that you, when you accept. you feel positive about it any any event any negative event the moment you accept it we know we go through a stage of denial and it takes us to come through but the moment you accept we are over the problem the first this one i think achievement again i think the perma model quite well covers that achievement a sense of achievement in life you know for example 
you know, probably today I'm going to be happy because so many of you have given me this great feedback. So I'm going to be happy because I feel I have made some difference in sharing my research. Maybe some people have benefited. It's a sense of achievement for me because what I've done for so many three, four years of work, probably in some small way I've shared. So it's a sense of achievement for me to be sharing with this small audience. So that probably, so that sense of achievement is actually quite important. So therefore, I totally agree. I think the Parma model quite very well fits in what. Uh, I think uh, this question was raised. I, I don't recall who raised that question, but that's really my submission. Certainly, yes, well-made point, uh, fully accepted. And I think the PERMA model is my kind of submission that probably that model uh, kind of gives us an idea how we can be happy. Thank you so much, sir, for thank patiently you, answering you. all our questions. Thank you. No, it's my it pleasure. such a lovely really session, <laughs> sir. We are very, very happy uh, with the, how the session went in today. We actually, it's increased our happiness index. <laughs> is what I can say. <laughs> Thank you, Thank sir. You. Uh, Thank I would like to uh, have uh, Krishnan, sir, give us the feedback of the session and Suresh, sir, to give us the vote of thanks. Uh, Satyan, sir, no words to express because, you know, it's all research-based. So you can't say generally that the happiness and things like that, you know, everything is, every slide and every word of yours was based on your research. And also, you know, like, you know, the Uncle Google also gave lots of uh, you know, data, you know, which we, we didn't even, you know, think about that Google can give this kind of thing, can this data can be used like that. And uh, it has given some kind of knowledge you know, where we can also look for what, and then th things like that. It's a fantastic session, very enlightening, enriching experience. And, uh, um, you know, you covered so much, you know, with, with this uh, 45, 50 minutes, you covered so much. It is probably, you know, uh, it's a one day session, probably, which you yeah. have comprised to, <laughs> <laughs> comprised yes. to, you know, one hour. It is fantastic. Thank you so very much. Uh, and, you know, I must thank uh, Anuradha ma'am also too. You know, uh, when I asked, you know, she was giving that. Thank you so very much. And uh, so it is, you know, all of us, you know, whoever is there in the session today, plus, you know, we are sharing this uh, entire session through uh, Facebook. So many people are going to be benefited. There is no doubt about it. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, sir. I, I really need to once again thank you know, Murugajan, sir, you. Uh, sorry, I forget the student from Christ University. I, can I have the name? Ekta, sir. Ekta. So, Ekta, Ekta. Thank you so much. Sir. I'm so proud you're here entering this session. Christ rights make us proud. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. It's been wonderful. You know. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I, I really thank the audience. They've been wonderful. I'm so enthused by the feedback. I'm going to jump with joy. You made my day, so I'm really happy today and probably have a cup of coffee with my wife and my son. So thank you once again. Very wonderful session. Thank you so much. Sir, uh, yes, my duty record my sincere thanks to you, sir, for uh, amazing presentation. I think you can, there are many feedback they already given. Um, uh, myself, I, I taken a few learnings from your session, sir. One is on research, finding how we can include Google search into presentation. It's amazing. And another <laughs> one is when you are uh, giving the points, which were, uh, clearly mentioned and that uh, background colors and then uh, the letters colors were highly catchy uh, two things i really enjoyed a lot and then and the points which were very familiar it is easy to understand even for the last session the strategy which was given for uh, enriching happiness a person who can able to read they can able to get the points that is the simplicity i can find it in your presentation sir um, I record my uh, sincere gratitude to you from uh, the Department of Psychology and Medical College and the core team uh, and the associating institutions and the different agencies, uh, associations of uh, different associations like uh, Indian Association of Mental Health and Wellbeing, International Association of uh, uh, Psychotherapy and Counseling and uh, International Association of Psycho-Oncology. So these were the associations. On behalf of them, I record my sincere thanks to you, sir. And I record my sincere thanks to all the participants. I thank you uh, for your uh, uh, continuous support of our initiative. Thank you all. We'll meet in uh, our 100th session on tomorrow. We'll meet again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Dear participants, you can uh, uh, send us questions and feedback to mywebinarfeedback at gmail.com and we will be getting it answered from the expert and we will be reverting it back to you. Please join us for the 100th session tomorrow. We are finally hitting a century and we are very, very excited as a core team. So we will see you tomorrow for another session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. For Thank you. Can I leave the meeting now? Yes, yes sir.